dear respected Thai, dear dear brothers and sisters. Um, <laughs> I think we. Where did the sheets end up? Okay. So. Um, Welcome, sisters. Can everyone hear clearly? No. Is that better? Testing one, two, three. It's clear? Breathing in, I know I'm breathing in. Yeah, not yet. Louder, huh? Okay. <laughs> breathing in, I know I'm breathing in. Breathing out, I know I'm breathing out. Yeah? Okay. <laughs> so, dear respected Thai. Thai had spent time going into uh, a text called The Wheel of the Different Schools Commentary. And um, it discussed the different tenets of the early schools of Buddhism. So this is in, the, in India, um, around the time of the Common Era, the beginning of the Common Era. Um, there are um, around, no? So, uh, we don't know exactly how many schools of Buddhism there were. Is that okay? <laughs> um, but what we have recorded is that there are at least 18 schools of mainstream, uh, we call mainstream now schools of Buddhism. And uh, some of them They got their name mainly just because of the geographic region in which they, they were. Some of them perhaps because of some teacher. Uh, and, uh, and some of them because of a certain uh, doctrine that they held to, like the Sarvastivada. They, uh, for example, they believed that all phenomena exist uh, not only in the present, but also in the future, as well as in the past. So, the, the school became known as the Sarvasti Vada. So it means Sarvasti. It means it always exists, yeah, whether in the present or the future or the past. Uh, there was a school called the Pudgalavada, which is the school of uh, the, that says that although we don't have a self in the five skandhas. And yet there is something that can be called a personality, or a person. <laughs> so, um, so there are different schools of Buddhism that uh, um, we will not go into in too much detail here. But after that teaching, Tai went into the different schools of Buddhism. Then he kind of pointed the arrow back towards Plum Village, towards, towards ourselves, and asked, what are the teachings that we have learned over the years in Plum Village by looking deeply into these early schools of Buddhism as well as from the benefit of the development of the Mahayana as it spread um, through monasteries in India and then was brought to China and later to Tibet as well and all of East Asia. So how can we, by looking at early Buddhism through the lens of the Mahayana, get a um, deeper insight into how we practice in the Plum Village tradition in the present moment. In addition to benefiting from the, the wisdom and insight of Mahayana teachings, 
we can also benefit from the study of science, especially in the West. So by looking into the nature of reality and understanding physics, understanding uh, biology, understanding uh, the science of the mind, psychology, we can also get insight. And Thay is very clear that uh, in our tradition of Buddhism we are not dogmatic. <laughs> so if uh, there's some insight that we can get, whether through our own practice or whether through an insight from the study of science uh, or, or whatever else, if that uh, helps us to be free and to transform our suffering, then we can incorporate that into the Plum Village tradition. So we are also flexible. We don't come at it from a dogmatic point of view, like this is the way and that is the right way and it cannot change. <laughs> but uh, what we should rather focus on is whether or not it helps us to be free. Yeah? Whether that teaching helps us to transform our suffering. And so Thay uh, then went ahead and taught these 40 tenets over the next couple of years. Um, but especially in the, the year of 2006 to 2007, that winter retreat. And then uh, it was published as a book, I think in 2013, finally in Vietnamese, 2014. Um, and the, the book in Vietnamese is called uh, Looking at Vulture's Peak. A Plum Village Looks at Vulture's Peak. Um, the book before it, which was about the, the looking at the schools of Buddhism, was called The Path to Vulture's Peak. And this uh, volume, which is Plum Village uh, Insight, uh, is called uh, Plum Village Looks at Vulture's Peak. So Vulture's Peak is a, is a mountain in, in Rajagraha, or Rajagriha, in, um, in India. And it's only, um, I don't know exactly, but you can walk in a, a day or two from Bodh Gaya to Rajagraha. It's, 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 a, it's um, or now it's called Rajgir. <laughs> uh, we went there with Thai in 2008 and that was a place where the Buddha loved to, to climb the mountain just like here at Deer Park we like to go up to Escondido Rock <laughs> or the breakfast rock and sit in the morning and enjoy the sunrise and drink tea and uh, eat a, a light breakfast so also the Buddha he enjoyed going up the vulture's peak to, to watch the sunrise or the sunset. Mm. And in 2008, we got to go with Thai up onto Vulture's Peak and spend the whole day. <laughs> Thai, Thai invited the whole delegation that was uh, traveling on, last, on Thai's last trip to India. Uh, he said, even if you need to go uh, to the bathroom, you can do it in the, in the bushes <laughs> because there's no toilet <laughs> on Vulture's Peak. It's, just, it's very wild. So we, we, we walked up uh, before sunrise with Thai and then you can sit there on one side of the top of the mountain. You can sit and look out and see the sun rising in the east. And then on the other side, you can sit in the, in the afternoon and watch the, the sun set. And I brought a hammock and set up the hammock and just spent the whole day there. And I, I remember Sister Gin, Gin Nim was sing, singing to Thai that day. <laughs> she was attending Thai. And so Thai really wanted us to go and enjoy Vulture's Peak in the way that the Buddha enjoyed being on Vulture's Peak. And we also performed the transmission of the five mindfulness trainings and, and the 14 mindfulness trainings on the top of uh, Vulture's Peak. And Thay uh, shaved our head again. 
<laughs> a little bit, not, not the whole thing. We, we, we went up in Thai. Just <laughs> ran the razor over. If we wanted to, Thai would do that. We went up and kind of to renew our, our aspiration. So Vulture Peak has a very deep significance in the Buddhist tradition as, as that aspiration of the highest teachings of the Buddha. Um, many of sutras were taught there and uh, it was a way, uh, set away from some of the other teaching areas of the Buddha, like the bamboo grove, which are more in a kind of nearby the town. So the vulture's peak, to go up there to hear the Buddha, you had to bring your food and <laughs> go for the day. It's, it's not a short trip. So in, in my, my own uh, insight from that experience is that it's, it's, a, it's a place where the Buddha liked to go for refuge. Um, of course he took refuge in nirvana, in the unconditioned, but I think he also liked to <laughs> just go up and enjoy the mountain, just like we do here. So by calling the book uh, on the 40 tenets, the Plum Village looking at Vulture's Peak, it means actually when we as um, Thais continuation, as part of the Plum Village tradition, when we look at Vulture's Peak, it means we look at the Buddha, the place that the Buddha enjoyed being and teaching in, in our heart. What do we see? So what kind of teachings do we, we see? And I, uh, I produced these 40 tenets. And so um, I think one brother mentioned to me, could we continue to learn the 40 tenets? Because we had started it a few, a few years ago. I think we had three or four classes, something like that. Brother Min Nim was not yet a monk. <laughs> and Brother Min Luk. Yeah. So I said, sure, I'll be happy to... Uh, to continue. And, and really, the spirit is that we do it together. So we, I, it's nourishing for, for me as well as for all of us to, to look into these, uh, these teachings. So I printed them out. And so everyone has a copy. And also, the, I'm, I promise to speak slowly for the sisters so they can learn English. And it's because they will also be giving English Dhamma talks very soon, so they need to learn. <laughs> so if I, I, I apologize if I, <laughs> I promise to uh, speak clearly and slowly. Because we have uh, experts in the English language here as well, so <laughs> I try to share for everyone. So, okay. Maybe we can listen to the sound of the bell. So the first, the first tenet Space is not an unconditioned Dharma
in uh, in the Buddhist teachings, we use the word Dhamma in various ways. So in this sense, it means a phenomena or phenomenon, singular. So anything is a Dhamma. This pen is a Dhamma. Um, electricity, light is a Dhamma. A anything can be anything that manifests, that, has, that causes some kind of perception, whether we perceive it or not, <laughs> is a Dhamma. Whether we perceive it, you know, whether it's uh, through the eye, the ear, the nose, tongue, body, or mind, these are all Dhammas. And in, the, in many uh, schools of Buddhism, we accept very easily that, for example, this table is a condition. If I take it apart, or if I take a hammer and I smash it, it can break. Even the plastic over time can break down, although it takes a long time for plastic <laughs> to break down, but it's also impermanent. So all the elements that make up this table are um, impermanent. It's come about due to conditions, and it's uh, subject to uh, falling apart for those uh, conditions to disassociate themselves, to become something else. So it's very easy for us to accept. It's easy for us to accept that the water in the cup of tea is also a condition phenomenon. We know that uh, now it manifests as liquid water, but if we lower the temperature, it can freeze into ice and become solid. Uh, and if we boil it, then it can turn into water vapor and move, go into the air and become a cloud. So the water is uh, also a condition. We can go back even farther and look at the components of water. It's H2O. And we know that uh, the very earliest stars, some of which still we can detect in the, even some of them in the Milky Way, in our neighborhood galaxy, are very, uh, they call low metallic stars. They, they don't even have um, elements like oxygen, only mainly hydrogen and helium. So they're from very early on, the oldest stars in the universe that were formed before the heavier elements like oxygen uh, were even composed. So we know that uh, even the oxygen is conditioned. <laughs> and even the hydrogen, the simplest atom, just one proton, one electron, is also a conditioned uh, element that we can separate that electron from the uh, proton <laughs> and have uh, the electron go spinning off and just have a proton. And even now we go deeper into the proton, we know that protons have not always existed. <laughs> Through the science we can see that in the early mi uh, milla, milla, milla of the Big Bang, there were not even hydrogen, there were not even uh, protons yet. So all we can see that actually even the, the, the constituent elements of water are conditioned so this is, a, this is not for the purpose of knowledge, but it's for the purpose of deep looking, to see that uh, everything is impermanent. And the Buddha said, as he, just bef moments before he, he went into uh, Pari Nibbana, that he, all things are conditioned. Okay? Uh, all things uh, are impermanent. All conditioned things are impermanent and strive diligently in your practice. So that theme of impermanence is always there as a concentration to help us to, to see that this body is not me, <laughs> these feelings are not me, these perceptions are not me, and then we are free. We don't feel uh, caught in our attachments anymore because we know that it's useless to be attached. <laughs> Actually, we cannot grab onto things because they are always changing. 
And so, when uh, the early um, teachers, the continuation of the Buddha, started to look at all these teachings, they, they started to divide them up into things that are conditioned and things that are unconditioned. Because the Buddha said many times that, for example, nirvana is unconditioned. He, he, he said, if, there were, if it were not for the unconditioned nature of Dhamma, there would not be freedom from the condition. And that is what our practice is, that is the core of our practice, is how to become free from the conditioning. Because the conditioned things, they, we, we, we try to grab onto them as being permanent. And that contributes to so much of the suffering that we experience in our lives. But they found that not only was nirvana unconditioned, but they also looked and they said that the space in which things manifest, so not the cup and not the water, but the space in which the cup manifests, that is also unconditioned. It's an unconditional phenomenon. And so, Thay, through his deep looking, as well as uh, with the insights we have from science, we know that actually space is also a conditioned phenomenon. So there are different ways to look at it. One way is to look at it from the point of view of conventional designation. So space in the sense of something that we call space, is obviously conditioned, right? Because um, it's just a designation, right? We, 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 we describe it as something that is the absence of, it is the container within which things manifest. But anything that we point to as being uh, <laughs> something is something that's occupying space and not space itself. And so space itself is just a conventional designation to describe the container, you might say, in which things are placed. In in, in that bell is not occupying the same space as where I am standing. And so that you know right away that I'm not in the bell and the bell is not in me. <laughs> we are not mutually obstructing each other. And so space is a word we use as a conventional designation to describe this situation that I am not you know, <laughs> occupying the same space as the bell. Yeah. Or if we are walking around, so I, I like to do the exercise um, where we are like atoms and we go, we walk around and sometimes when we get very hot, we walk very quickly and when we are cold, we slow down. Has anyone ever done that? It's very fun and then you're, you become very mindful of you see, uh, people walking around you. Or if you've ever been to Grand Central Station in New York City. Has anyone ever been <laughs> to Grand Central? Yeah. And you notice that there are many entrances and there are many exits, right? And so when people are walking through it, the way the building is designed, people are, some, somebody who's over here is going over there or they're going over here and somebody who came in over here is going over there. And so in the middle, people have to <laughs> kind of mesh with each other and yet somehow it all happens magically without people bumping into one another and that's because they have a sense of space so there's a, there's a kind of proprioception sense of how much space the body occupies and then we have a natural sense of mindfulness even if we don't practice mindfulness we we, we actually can yeah, we also herd animals as human beings we, we, we are very sensitive to moving in the herd in a way that we don't bump into each other. So in that sense, it's very clear that space is, is a conditioned dhamma. It's just a conventional designation. It's a way of describing the fact that we don't mutually ob obstruct one another in the same <laughs> space. And Thay, Thay like to use the, uh, the image of a flower arrangement, like the, the flowers, the, 
I think, I don't know, Ngia Ngim, or I don't know which sister arranges the flowers. Yeah. And, and each flower occupies its space. We don't try to just bunch them all together <laughs> so they look crowded, but we know how to arrange the, the flowers in a way that they each uh, contribute their beauty, but they are not obstructing one another. So that's another image of space. And so clearly we can see that that's a conditioned dhamma, the sense of space. But with the insight of the relativity, we also know that at a deeper level, at a physical level, what we call space is actually also conditioned. So, if we think of space as, again, this is just an image, and we have a, a, a very massive body. Of course, space is, is three-dimensional, right? We can go up, down, we can go across. Sorry, we can go uh, length, height, and width. Right, in three directions. But if we, in order to conceptualize space, here we just draw it as a two-dimensional plane because it's hard to draw it in three dimensions. And you have a massive body like the sun or, or a star. But actually any body, any, even the tiniest atom, it will, because of the force of gravity, it will, and I don't know if I'll be able to draw this, but <laughs> it will start to um, to bend. And it's almost like a, you should have a piece of cloth and you put a ball in it, a metal ball, and it distorts the piece of cloth, right? The gravity is actually pulling, is actually distorting the very fabric of space, what they call a space-time continuum. And now we've discovered that there are actually even waves in that space-time continuum called gravitational waves. Uh, recently they've built two sensors. I think one of them is near Seattle and the other one is somewhere in the deep south. They have to be in an L shape, and they've, uh, I think, what was it, like five years ago, four years ago, they actually detected the first gravitational wave. So when there is a, um, that means that there's a, a really massive body that there's a, a ripple of gravitational force. So it means a, like a supernova, where, this, where suddenly a very massive body explodes and the mass that is distorting the, the space-time continuum is ejected often millions of miles in every direction. And so that causes an actual kind of ripple to pass through the continuum of space. And we can detect it now when that happens. They found ways to, I don't know, the, I forget the details how they do it, but <laughs> I remember that you need to have like two sensors in different points on the Earth and then compare the results. And then through doing that, you actually, you can detect this, this ripple which is passing through the fabric of space. So obviously, if space is, is, has waves going through it, just like water that we learned is conditioned, and we know that space is also conditioned. And Thai also uh, invites us to look into the relationship between space and time, which uh, we also learn from, from the Abhidhamsaka Sutra, but also from Einstein. <laughs> so the insight that uh, actually space and time are both the manifestations of one, the same thing. They're not like separate. So as we, we move through time, yeah, there's this, time is w one way of describing movement through the same continuum that we speak of as moving through space. And um, 
And so we, we now um, you know, look at time as actually a fourth dimension, already from a hundred years ago, from Einstein. And, uh, and so that time itself is also a condition. You know, we, we, we only experience this present moment, and what we think of as a future is just a present moment, which is, <laughs> which is uh, because of our memory and the continuity of consciousness, we experience always moving as if we're moving forward. And especially we have clocks and they start you know, going around and they seem to be progressing in a linear way, well, circular way, but a linear way from the past into the future. But actually, all we really have is the present moment. <laughs> That's all there really is. And then memories about the past, impressions that we've had that stay on consciousness. And whatever is in the future is just uh, the functioning of our nervous system in anticipation based on the conditions that we have observed. We observe in the present moment and what we have observed in the past, we try to predict what will happen in the future. And so it's actually not there. <laughs> and so this whole concept of time is actually, when we look deeply at it, is conditioned in, uh, is based on our consciousness. What we talk about as time is also a conventional designation and is also uh, a conditioned Dharma. So this is the insight of the first tenet, is that we can no longer naively talk about space as being an unconditioned dharma. It is also conditioned. It, it manifests together with... with How does huh? space relate to consciousness? Yeah, the, uh, what's the next one? <laughs> So Brother Datwe asks, how does space relate to consciousness? Let me just fill in the rest of the tenet. So space manifests together with time, matter, and consciousness. Yeah, so, so we can look at time from the perspective of consciousness. We can also look at space from the perspective of consciousness. So the concentration on impermanence, for example, is what helps us to be free from attachment to uh, ideas about time. And the insight of non-self is the insight which helps us to be free from ideas and attachment in our consciousness with regards to space. So, so time as a conditioned dharma um, When we suffer, because for example, we, we wish that we were at that time when we were very young, when some moment when we just felt so happy, we were so free, we had no, we were with our family maybe, 
not all of us maybe were happy in our family, but you can see one moment when I can, I, I always look back to my childhood growing up in, in my house and it would maybe be a summer day and we were on a river, a kind of lake, and it just seemed like everything was so wonderful. <laughs> it was nice outside, I could go swimming, um, beautiful nature all around the forest, and I just, uh, and I know that there were times before I learned meditation, and even when I learned meditation, when I would wish to go back to that time where everything seemed very happy and joyful when I was suffering. <laughs> and so there was an attachment to time. There was an attachment to my memory of time past. And so without the antidote, without the way of kind of becoming free from attachment to time, as a condition, Dhamma, I suffer. But with the concentration on impermanence, then I become free. <laughs> so time is linked to the practice of impermanence. So we could say the concentration on impermanence is how we touch the unconditioned in time. So we become free from the condition aspects of time. And we'll, we'll see that in the second tenet. Because already when we get to the second tenet, we see that Tai then says, in the historical dimension, all dhammas are conditioned. But in the ultimate dimension, all dhammas are unconditioned. So even we are saying now that space is not an unconditioned dhamma, but in the sense of the ultimate, all dhammas are unconditioned. Yeah. You did a really good job of describing a condition. Yeah. Right. Conditional phenomena are things that can be broken down. Mm. Can you talk a little more about and define unconditioned? Yeah. Okay. And maybe an example. <laughs> okay. But let me finish with uh, Brother Dautoy's question first. Okay. So Brother um, Prabhu asked to go into uh, describe with examples the unconditioned. Okay, but I'll continue with the... So in terms of space, We talk about non-self. So it means that there's nothing essential that all things are empty of a separate self. So the teaching on non-self doesn't is not a teaching on negation. It doesn't mean that we that what we perceive is not real, is, not, uh, is, is non-existent. But it means that there's nothing um, permanent, there's nothing that, is, uh, that can be by itself alone, that is anywhere in, sp in space, whether in ourselves, or in another person, or uh, some higher being like God, or something anything we imagine, some place that where things suddenly are permanent, like a heaven where is it, that is eternal. But actually, everywhere in space has the quality of being empty of a separate self. And that is not uh, for the, the purpose of just declaring, uh, 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 taking a philosophical stance. Or, or declaring a kind of um, the, uh, an objective nature of things, but it's for the purpose of, of uh, practice. It's for the purpose of being free from attachment. Normally we think, ah, if I could only go to, I don't know why it comes to mind, but Disneyland. <laughs> If I could only go, now we're in the pandemic, some of us would just, if I could only go out to a restaurant, 
and enjoy uh, my favorite uh, Indian food. Oh, if I could only, uh, you know, go to see my, my, um, my family or whatever it is. Yeah? So we are not happy where we are and we want to go somewhere else. And if we're, we think if we are there, we will be happy. So that is an attachment to a sense of place, right? A sense of place in space. Here, I suffer. If I go over there, I'll be happy. <laughs> um, there's a sense of um, suffering that comes about from um, our body, right? Our body occupies space. And we look at our body and we think, oh, I'm too fat. Oh, I'm too short. I'm too skinny. <laughs> And we suffer because of this, the, 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 the form of our body the, that it takes in space. So then when we look with the eyes of non-self, we see that everything in the body is just a manifestation of condition. And it's, not, it's, it's, not, uh, it's also condition, and it's also something we don't need to suffer about because we know that it's impermanent and that it will not always be like this. Now the body is there, and then it will disappear, but it is not the... If we are not attached, we don't need to suffer about it. <laughs> so, so to, if we talk about what is an unconditioned Dhamma, so anything, so what I do in my own practice is to notice that uh, anything that I can perceive that gives rise to a perception is already conditioned. <laughs> yeah, if it has some quality, some color, some sound, some uh, smell, some, even some concept, uh, then it's already conditioned. <laughs> yeah. So this is, this is a very subtle um, part of meditation practice, because there are parts uh, in us, there are feelings in us, and sometimes we might label that feeling and say, that is nirvana, that is the unconditioned. And then you actually are um, mistakenly labeled something that is conditioned as something that is unconditioned, a certain feeling. And so and there are many times when the Buddha, he, 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 could, not, uh, he could not put a word <laughs> to describe nirvana. He could, he could not put a color. He could, every, every word he felt was insufficient. Even nirvana is insufficient to describe the unconditioned. Even the unconditioned is sufficient. Because to understand the, condition, the unconditioned, we only have the conditioned as an example with which to understand the unconditioned. And so every example will ultimately be inadequate. <laughs> Because it's not something that can be expressed in words, it's not something that can be expressed, uh, can be located in space, or it can be located in time. Is that clear? <laughs> so that, you know, any example will ultimately fail because the unconditioned, because <laughs> any example will finally be conditioned. But an example that I like to use just to illustrate it. And again, it's just a model. If we, uh, are, like when I drew this fabric of the space-time continuum, it's just a model. Actually, science proceeds using images or models of an atom of the solar system that we can comprehend, but that's only a concept. It's only a model to help us to grasp a deeper reality which we cannot you know, we can, ultimately we can't, um, we can't model because it's, it's, it's there in the fabric of reality. <laughs> it's not something that you can just uh, make a, a model of. But Tai, tai used the example of the wave and the water. And we'll keep coming back to that. Right? So we can think of uh, a wave that's going over the ocean like here in, in the beach. And, and each wave is uh, going up and going down. 
right? So it's like the, the phenomena that we experience, right? Like Brother Min Luk is sitting there, and he is a manifestation. He is like a wave on the, the, the surface of uh, reality. And um, so is Brother Min Yun, right? and so, is the, so are the flowers on the altar, so is the light in this room. Everything that we can perceive is a manifestation, like the waves on the water. And uh, we suffer because we as a wave, and as we perceive other waves, other things, other phenomena, and we, we also look in ourselves and we see we are, com we are composite, we are made up of all kinds of different phenomena manifesting at the same time, that uh, all of these are, are, are changing, are always subject to birth and death. And so it seemed like there's no safe place anywhere <laughs> because the body is not safe. If I get attached to my body looking like this or my hands looking like this or, or feelings being like this or perceptions being like they are, then I will suffer when they're not no longer like that. Just like the wave, when it goes down, <laughs> it, it, maybe when it's up, it looks down in the trough in the, uh, between the waves and it fears what it, will feel, what it will be like if it goes down like that. And it wants to stay up at the top of the crest of the wave forever. And so when we are happy, when our life is going very well, then we are like that. We are up high, everything's great. And then some suffering comes. It's in our nature, in the wave, to then go down also. And then we look back. So if we don't know this insight of um, impermanence, of that, that our nature is to go up and down, right? To be born and to die, then we suffer. So the, 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 the way that Thay proposes for the wave to practice, to be free from that suffering, is to see that its nature is water. So whether it's up, whether it's down, it's still water. It's, it's, it's uh, the ground of its very uh, manifestation. And so, uh, maybe we, we already uh, start to go into the second tenet. Uh, it's not... Uh, not here yet in a second. But we can talk about um, <coughs> like we can talk about in that sense that the that phenomena that the uncondition is the ground of the condition. Yeah. Is that clear? Yeah, I mean I know Fabu knows already. So <laughs> He's giving me a hard time. <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> no, it's, 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 this, is, uh, this has really helped me to understand. Um, because I, I find that, that metaphor of the wave and the water very, very helpful. Right? It's, not, it's not for the purpose of just uh, having a philosophy. It's, a, it's an image, it's actually, Thay did not come up with that image. It's, it's a very uh, old one in the Buddhist tradition of understanding the, the unconditioned. Because, again, these are all just images that we're trying to use to bring us in the direction of understanding, of touching, of realizing the unconditioned. When, when finally, it's not something that you can grasp onto. It's ultimately, it defies any kind of word or designation, like any kind of model. So you can get rid of the wave in the water <laughs> idea because, I, if, again, any metaphor, you can say, well, but you just told me that water is a conditioned dhamma, and now you're saying that water is the unconditioned, but then you miss the point because it's a metaphor. And if we take the metaphor is to help us to, to, to see the dhamma, it's, it's not, not to it's not for the purpose of um, describing absolute reality. And this is very fundamental to 
any, you know, any uh, way of um, studying these 40 tenets or, or understanding Thai's teaching is that the purpose of the teaching is not to describe reality. A lot of what we do in, in, in um, what you might call this, the, the scientific materialist uh, approach to understanding is to, to try to create a description of reality. Yeah. So words are describing as closely as possible the actual situation of reality. But from the, the point of view of practice, we know that th that can never be realized <laughs> because words themselves are just metaphors. They're just models. We cannot possibly use words to describe reality. That's, 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 it cannot happen. <laughs> and so a lot of the suffering in, comes about, right, in, in scientific discoveries when we we use words to describe something, but actually we find out that they're inadequate. And so it actually contributes to ignorance. And so we have to, as scientists and also as practitioners, we have to be able to be free, not to get caught in those traps that are created by the words. And no, just when we're sitting in the morning, following our breath, not having our mind dwell anywhere, that is already a, a deep realization. And you don't need to practice for many lifetimes to touch that. You can quiet your mind and you can touch this at any moment. And that's Thay's invitation to us, is that Nirvana is in the here and now. Don't put it somewhere, you know, somewhere else in space, right? Or time. In the Buddhist tradition, we have been caught in that trap for many centuries, saying that, uh, oh, in the time of the Buddha, there were many awakened ones, there were many arhats, perfected ones. And, but now we are in the time of the, you know, semblance dharma or whatever, you know, the ending age of the dharma. We can no longer touch nirvana. That, that was something that happened long ago in the past, in time. And if we want to touch nirvana, actually we have to practice for many lifetimes and die and be reborn and die and re like perfect our practice and, and finally sometime long into the future we will touch nirvana and that's very you know, saying that's, that is a very wrong understanding of the Buddha's teaching <laughs> that is like a, oh, I'm just going to enjoy my life as a monk I just uh, have a nice uh, nice room nice bed, nice food and I'll just quietly practice to it touch nirvana, maybe, I don't know, in 20 lifetimes or 100 lifetimes. And then the monks and nuns, they become very lazy. Well, I think the monks become lazy. The nuns practice very diligently, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but the monks become a very... <laughs> I don't know. That, that, that kind of thinking can make us very relaxed, like very um, lazy. <laughs> And uh, it's not that when you know our practice should be like, you know, <laughs> but rather we should we should have the the bodhicitta, the mind of awakening, to to see that it's possible not to suffer. It's possible to be free from suffering. We don't have to continue to follow our, our conditioned thinking, and so we have to see that consciousness is also contributing to space and time. That there is no, there is no understanding of time that is possible without consciousness. And that is something that um, I think only now some scientists are beginning to understand. <laughs> when we go deeply into neuroscience, in the science of the mind, we see that actually, you know, just like in quantum physics, we, we want to locate the subatomic particle at the same time that we know its velocity. But actually, by 
knowing its location, we, we already, by observing its location, by being the one whose consciousness is, uh, is uh, perceiving that subatomic particle, already we can no longer know what its velocity is. And that, that works. You know, for, that's, that's part of the reason we, we have computers, we have, you know, we have all kinds of um, technology which is dependent on this understanding of quantum mechanics. And it doesn't seem to jive with a classic, at all with a classical understanding of science, like a Newtonian understanding where physical objects occupy a space and they, are, they have a velocity and those things can both be known. And the insight is that actually the, the observer is, the, the, the aspect of observation changes the observed. And so space, and in the same way, space and time at a quantum level are dependent on consciousness. Consciousness, the observer, is affecting what is observed. And that is an insight already in many, for many centuries in the Buddhist tradition that ultimately subject depends on the object. And they are, they are, they are conditioned. You cannot have an, a subject by itself alone without the object. They co-arise with one another. And when the subject dis, dis, disappears, it is no longer manifest, then the object also no longer is there. So, we can only talk about time and space um, with, a, with a, a sense of awareness of space and awareness of time. And so in that way they are conditioned. So Thay said it manifests together with time, matter and consciousness. And matter is not separate from space. So the, the, the old understanding Thay is updating in the Buddhist tradition is that matter is conditioned, but space is unconditioned. And Thay say, no, space is also conditioned. It manifests together with matter, time, and consciousness. We cannot separate them out. They are, they inter are. And that is the teaching of the Avatamsaka Sutra, of the one is in the all and the all is in the one. So, by looking in understanding, for example, the nature of quantum mechanics, the nature of subatomic particles, then we understand how it is that the sun continues to generate heat and light. Before that, we didn't know. We thought, well, it's just burning some fuel. Back in the 19th century, they one scientist predicted that the sun has only been around for, I can't remember, something like a million years or something, or even less, like tens of thousands of years, and that it would probably burn out in fuel, run out of fuel in, I don't know, tens ten or hundreds of thousands of years in the future. And that's because they didn't understand at a subatomic level. It took actually looking into the very tiniest particles, like electrons, and shooting them through slits <laughs> and understanding how they function before we could understand how is it that the sun is generating all this energy. And that is a very concrete manifestation of the insight of the one is in the all and the all is in the one. <laughs> By looking into the smallest things, we actually see the largest thing, like a star or the nature of the Big Bang. Now we can look and study the red shift in the light that is traveling through the universe and know that the, the universe is moving outwards and by that we can determine that at some point it was everything in one singularity. <laughs> yeah. And we don't know what happened before then. Now, now many more scientists are saying that actually that's not necessary. We cannot call that a beginning. They're getting closer to the insight of Buddhism which is that all of this is happening since beginningless time. And even the Big Bang, the singularity, is we cannot call that a beginning. But we cannot see 
we are not able to see past that. So we say, well, that must be the beginning. But that is only the lack of our understanding, the lack of our perception. That is a limit, because yeah? we are limited in our, percep our, our capacity to perceive. So I hope this helps to, it's, yeah, I think there could be a more in this, but this is my, my uh, <laughs> you know, how I practice with this tenet and how I understand what Thaisa uh, transmitting through it. So, um, yeah, it's, it's 8.40. I don't know if there are any other questions about anything. Or if I uh, was, if I covered the, the questions that were asked sufficiently. <laughs> Kenley, Kenley told me a few years ago that when you guys give talks, you need to leave time for questions at the end. <laughs> So I, I said, okay, I'll train myself. <laughs> well, we can uh, reflect on it, and then next week, if there's something that's not clear, or something that um, maybe you get a new insight as well from some, some part of this, then please uh, bring it to the next class, and we can look into it. So maybe I'll, I'll stop there, just with the first tenet. And uh, please, if you can bring this sheet to, to class uh, next week, so you don't have to keep printing off copies. And if there are any other sisters who are interested, please let them know. I don't know if it, was it announced in Clarity? Or no? Mm. Kind of. <laughs> okay. And do the sisters have a, a copy of Lang Mai? Yeah, you have? Okay, so it's good to read over it. <laughs> and uh, I'm sorry that we don't have the English one yet. Um, I'm trying to be... Um, because I know that uh, we're working on the book. One, one Sister Lang Min is working on uh, the book. So, um, I'll see. See if we can have something to also for the English speakers to, to look into. Okay, thank you so much for coming.